Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure today to introduce Daniel Brunner, who is a CNRS uh, researcher in Femto SP in Besançon. So, to, Daniel is going to present his work on uh, photonic neural networks for integrated optics. Daniel, it's your, you have the microphone. Thanks, uh, thanks, Muhammad. Well, actually, it's our work, but uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, also, it's quite funny that uh, um, my name changes. So I used to be in Karlsruhe, student in Karlsruhe. There was Daniel. Then uh, I moved to Scotland, uh, Daniel. Then I moved to Spain, and now I'm in France. And every time, you know, name and surname it uh, appears to adjust. <laughs> um, so what I will present today is a um, strategy for implementing um, neural networks using photonics and with a particular focus on uh, the scalability of integration strategies. And um, uh, here I will essentially present various strategies to implement such networks and I will finish with a new concept which we are about to, well, which is submitted, which I hope is about to publish. And depending on time, I will uh, just as a kind of a, a dessert, I will show uh, something completely unrelated, but a photonic neural network where we implement everything. Where, uh, the entire system is implemented in photonic, fully parallel um, uh, uh, architectures, and uh, the learning is also, or the training is hardware implemented. And it's, it's just something uh, which is nice to see. Yep. Okay. So the motivation for exploring photonics as a hardware substrate in neural network essentially can be summarized with these two figures, which are showing very different dimensions of the challenge, but they're very complementary. <laughs> so the left side is a um, illustration of various, you can say, canonical neural network architecture. So for example, here, Lunette from Jan Lecan when he was still in Paris. Um, and you see here a plot of uh, essentially computational volume or a measure of computational volume um, expanded towards artificial intelligence or machine learning concepts, uh, computational volume, and as it develops over time. And you can see here that for the first, let's say, 50 years, this essentially went hand in hand with uh, the scaling of Moore's law, where we had a, a doubling every 18 months, every two years. And then um, the breakthrough on the back of a deep convolutional neural network happened in uh, 2011 until 2013 mostly. And then we saw a drastic shift in uh, scaling. So this really was a, let's say, phase transition. And now um, the scaling of computational uh, volume has increased to doubling every 3.4, every four months. So this really is dramatic, and this shows um, uh, that essentially we have a very big task in front of us if we want to keep something like this sustainable, not only in terms of uh, what is available of the system, but also what can be sustained by, let's say, ultimately our planet, but these are the very big words. Um, and on the right side, what you can see here is a review paper by Roy Tertel, where um, you see the relationship between um, the peak power consumption between different special purpose uh, neural network processors and their peak performance. So these are not your everyday uh, Arduino, Raspberry Pi, CPU systems. They're really uh, integrated electronic chips, uh, uh, systems, and even racks, which are designed and operated for only neural network computing. So they're optimized. And um, what is very interesting here is that essentially across six orders of magnitude, you can see here how the energy efficiency per computation or the, yeah, the energy uh, 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 um, uh, consumption per operational uh, computation operation essentially remains con uh, constant within, uh, let's say, a spread of uh, roughly two orders of magnitude. The problem now is if you compare this kind of scaling with this kind of spread, it becomes pretty clear that if we want to provide a, a lasting future for um, neural network computing, as we did for, let's say, classical uh, Turing and for Neumann concepts, then here really something drastic needs to change. We need to ideally shift this entire graph to the left top. If not, we just need to dramatically reduce the energy consumption. 
and um, in less abstract numbers, uh, something very interesting is uh, around 12, 14 months ago, um, the current state of the art neural network system, the generative uh, pre-trained transformer model uh, was introduced and that requires on a single um, uh, top of the notch GPU 355 years for training which translates in an electricity bill of $4 million. And of course, that can immediately be linked to an energy consumption and, um, and a carbon footprint. So these are really big problems and uh, they don't go away. And uh, considering the economic importance of neural networks, this is really a problem which we need to address. And I hope um, my take on why photonics can be at least a complementary strategy uh, will convince you to a certain degree. So the first primer I like to take in these kind of uh, 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 more general presentations uh, is that the original primer for uh, neural network computing per se was actually biology. So here on the left side, you see hand drawings from uh, Ramon Cajal, which were done at the end of 1900 turn of the uh, towards 20th century <coughs> and essentially um, um, applied mathematicians asked themselves how could such a system compute so how can obviously a system which comprises of a network where some blobs so the soma of the neuron cells are connected into a very high dimensional and complex network structure how could, how could something like this be leveraged for computing and uh, there, McAuliffe and uh, Pitts, in 1948, they essentially came up with the first uh, uh, manifestation of what now can be interpreted as a neural network, where they now tried uh, to realize logical operations with such a topology. And then, um, following uh, more theoretical work in this direction, essentially around 1970s, 80s, people realized that if we want to really efficiently leverage such computation concept, we need to move towards a hardware implementation which respects the fundamental features of such a system. And this essentially coined the term uh, neuromorphic computing systems, in this case, uh, electronic systems of code by Carver Mead. So my second primer then always is, uh, okay, we can take inspiration from biology, but in the end we are, let's say, engineers or physicists so we can abstract away the fundamental concepts and then try to embody them in other systems which are fundamentally potent or hopefully fundamentally better suited to um, realize these operations and here's a very interesting uh, special issue from a from a conference from 1990 where let's call him the godfather of digital holography, essentially uh, uh, popularized some fundamental observations, which um, I know he was not the first which came up with these, but uh, they're very nicely summarized here. Where computing essentially uh, comprises of two fundamental operations. The first is a logic interaction, uh, but if we extend this to a more general computing, it would be a transformation of information, a nonlinear transformation. And the, answer, uh, the other part is transport of uh, information, so information transduction. And essentially, uh, it is obvious for fundamental physics uh, 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 yeah, features, the transformation of information is uh, inherently, or at least with the current systems at hand, better suited towards um, electronics, simply because electrons have Coulomb interaction, they are uh, fermionic particles, so there's, uh, there's strong interaction between electrons and thereby they, they very quickly um, um, implement nonlinearity. However, for information transduction, this is exactly the opposite. You want that information on the linear part of the system doesn't interact. And for that, uh, uh, photonics is since many years basically being considered a really very uh, promising uh, uh, strategy. And this is also why essentially um, optical communication takes over and now really approaches uh, the chip level. And I think actually the final push that these systems really will rely on optical communication might be linked to the neural network computing. So to put this a little bit more into a, a direct perspective, uh, here on the top, you can see something like a canonical illustration of a neural network where you have neurons. They are these uh, circles, these blobs, 
um, and yeah, every neuron essentially has an internal state which depends on the input it receives from um, um, uh, other neurons. So here in this uh, deep feed forward neural network structures, this would be essentially the input from uh, neurons in the preceding layer according to some connection topology. You might add a bias for each neuron, and then the output of each neuron essentially is a nonlinear map of its internal state. And this is essentially where the problem lies. This connectivity uh, matrix essentially describes these uh, connections between neuron, neurons or between layers of neurons, and it corresponds to this original inspiration. And essentially, already you can see here, if we want to implement this with classical electronic, mostly 2D lithography, we are facing a really, really big challenge. But besides, uh, let's say, geometric aspects, um, there are also more fundamental problems to this. And this really makes us interconnect the curse of, let's say, or let's say the curse of inter uh, electronic integration. So the problem is that if you want to switch a wire, um, you have a fundamental energy consumption associated to it, which is a CV squared at least. So if you charge a wire, you have a half CV uh, squared, but then you need to discharge this energy of the charged wire in the input impedance of the following component. So therefore you have twice this because that energy needs to be moved from your circuit because it is transformed into heat. And this heat removal usually never happens at 100% efficiency, though this is rather the lower limit. So the problem now is that essentially if you reduce the scaling of integration in electronics, you see that what you can um, expect in terms of capacity reduction is maximally a linear uh, improvement. And this is because uh, the capacity essentially linearly scales with the length of a, of a circuit element. And if you increase the uh, uh, integration resolution, then this length reduces. But essentially the term associated to the area of the circuit um, doesn't really help you because it depends on the ratio between a wire dimension and the distance to a next uh, to the neighboring wire and those dimensions essentially these geometric factors they remain constant because you want to have a dense integration and on top of it this depends on the logarithm of this so essentially there's nothing to be gained and what is really interesting you can see that uh, uh, the capacity per unit length is essentially the same if you compare a bnc cable with a 20 nanometer uh, CMOS integrated wire per unit length. Um, so this shows really that there is nothing much to gain besides a linear uh, uh, improvement. If we go photonics, uh, then we get rid of this uh, uh, capacity energy uh, penalty, the capacitive energy penalty. Uh, we need to deal with losses, but uh, in modern integrated circuits, they drop to really negligible levels almost on the relevant length scales. But what we have to feed, uh, face are much larger feature sizes simply because of the wave functions uh, happen in different, uh, um, uh, yeah, along different length scales. However, I would argue what we want is uh, scalability of a system. So therefore, uh, an initial penalty is not so uh, painful as long as you can realize systems which continue to scale well with your implementation. And this is essentially what I want to pursue. So the currently best implementation of electronic neural networks, they use uh, very special um, implemented uh, uh, circuits, um, for example, tensor, tensor cores. So these are just uh, uh, systolic arrays in order to, to implement vector matrix products um, where they realize, uh, 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 does this show? Yes. So essentially you can shift an input vector in steps through your circuit and then um, you get in parallel computing of various elements. But the problem is you can't really scale this up to significant numbers. The other problem is, or another interesting feature is that uh, in electronics, people pursue um, low resolution digital electronics um, in order to reduce the energy consumption. However, if you go low resolution, then there's a very interesting observation it is when you do digital low resolution um, information encoding, you actually pay a very, very big initial energy penalty simply because you need to uh, arrive at a very, very low um, um, uh, error rate in your digital symbol encoding. So therefore such low precision digital computing has four to six 
uh, orders of magnitude energy penalty associated to it compared to analog or uh, neuromorphic concept. I don't want to go into detail what they are here. If we compare them to, uh, to digital electronics at low precisions, and these really are fundamental physical um, uh, limits, which are associated to Brownian motion um, of thermal noise. So there is not much to be gained from here. And actually in experiments, we approach these limits within a linear scaling factor. So we are not so much uh, away from the real thermodynamic limits of analog information encoding. So therefore the question is, why should we keep up all this the entire digital electronic concept? And why won't we use uh, move towards analog implementation of those, such systems. Um, so this is an avenue which is essentially been pursued since, uh, let's say, end of 2010, 2011 is when we started with our concept. However, the concept we pursued was rather uh, uh, special, it's called reservoir computing. The more general purpose kind of implementation of such programmable um, interconnection matrices was demonstrated in 2017 uh, by a group from MIT from uh, Marin Soljacic. And what you can see here is a mesh of Mach center interferometers which, where, which implements a fully programmable um, unitary matrix. Uh, and in this paper, essentially they demonstrated um, the parallel programming of a four by four uh, uh, connectivity matrix uh, i.e. you map four inputs to four outputs. Um, at the beginning of this year, uh, this was then, let's say, significantly scaled up and it was changed in its implementation. I think this is also a previous alumni, at least as a junior professor from the KIT, there um, <clears throat> from uh, the group from uh, Wolfram Pernis and collaborators, for example, Kippenberg uh, from APFL and others from Harvard, uh, from Oxford. They implemented such a uh, linear vector matrix um, engine using phase change materials based on a crossbar array. So you can imagine every input uh, dimension of a vector essentially corresponds to a line. Every output of uh, every dimension of an output of this uh, vector matrix multiplier corresponds to a vertical line in between at the crossings. These are connected using, for example, phase change materials. So with this, you can implement vector matrix multipliers with very, very high speed. So the latency is picoseconds uh, and essentially unlimited bandwidth. The losses are very low because by silicon photonics, you approach dB per centimeter. And this is compatible with CMOS fabrication technology. But the problem really lies again in this uh, scalability in my point of view. So if you look at the feature sizes, just realizing a four cross four matrix requires a millimeter square. And the problem is that this scales in the end quadratic with um, uh, the, the number of components. So if we look at this concept of a crossbar array, this is what this uh, um, method is referred to. We have here our linear input channels. We map them onto our output channels and essentially the area of, this, of the circuit scales quadratic with the number of input and output channels. So therefore, this is not really a scalable approach. And if you consider the, the length scales um, for chips of a relevant size of neural network systems, essentially we will need uh, uh, integrated silicon photonic uh, circuits, which are the size of a desktop. And um, we, I don't think we can expect a really dramatic uh, four orders of magnitude reduction in this size. However, if we change our approach and we go 3D, then we can really unlock a completely different scaling law because we now use area versus volume. So input and output channels would be encoded in 2D planes and in the connection between them, in the connectivity volume, we can now realize all these connections. And just by leveraging, let's say, the uh, rather unelegant first principle uh, idea is for every input channel, we have a dedicated routing plane. With this, we transform this entire interconnect challenge uh, in such a scaling that area as well as height of the circuit now scale linear with the number of input and output channels. So, and this essentially is the strategy we want to uh, pursue here uh, in, in uh, FEMTOST and uh, com uh, in collaboration also with Dimitri Psaltis at DBFL. So, why does this really motivate photonics? Um, if we look at the development of the last years in terms of microprocessor scaling, mm -hmm. 
what we can see is that essentially after 2000, uh, neither frequency nor power consumption continued to grow or the clock frequency of such uh, electronic micro microprocessors. And the uh, simple and practical limit for that is simply the heat deposition. So we can't efficiently continue to extract heat from these circuits. And if you now think that this is already the case for a 2D system, so let's say the silicon chip is almost completely 2D, you might have 10, 20 routing planes, but I'm talking here about hundreds and thousands of such routing planes, then every heat reducing element is rather at a very short distance to a heat sink, to a heat extraction element. So therefore the heat extraction should be efficient. If you now translate this into 3D, then this is not the case. Uh, an element in the center of such a circuit, which has not be cooled at all anymore. And therefore I do not see a clear uh, avenue for electronic 3D, at least large scale integration. However, since in photonics, uh, uh, we do not deposit energy primarily within these connections, we should actually be able to circumvent this problem. So the concept what we use is uh, uh, two photon polymerization, also uh, dubbed photonic wire bonding uh, in supply to wave guides. What we use, and I think, uh, I think most people in the audience would be very familiar with this, we use a, uh, uh, in our case, liquid resin containing uh, monomers and photoactivators. Inside of this, we focus a femtosecond laser, usually with the high-NA microscope objective. And then within the voxel of this uh, uh, writing laser, we induce a process called two-photon polymerization. In this transition from the monomers to the polymers, the polymer chains start linking up and therefore essentially for, uh, form a rigid and uh, solid uh, skeleton. And uh, we can then essentially by dragging this focus, for example, through the liquid resin, we can then uh, realize complex 3D shapes. Um, and since we use two photon polymerization also below the upper refraction limit, and we use here a common commercial system from Nanoscribe uh, with the IB dip uh, resin. So our first, let's say, uh, I would call it brute force uh, approach to this was really just to simply uh, write our uh, plastic structures, our polymer structures to implement these uh, 3D connections. So here on the left, you could imagine if these are now the outputs of a photonic neuron, a laser, a modulator, whatever, then that signal is split at the bifurcation site here into nine output waveguides. Um, and with this, you could then implement a mapping of one to nine uh, neurons. However, what you can see here is we follow a, a fractal or scale free approach. So if you now realize an array of such one to nine splitters and you then combine them again to another one to nine splitters, which geometrically scales with the degree of uh, bifurcation, then already in the second uh, bifurcation layer, you uh, realize uh, 81 connections. And therefore this essentially the degree of connectivity scales exponentially. And with very few layers of such bifurcations, you reach connectivity degrees, which are essentially sufficient for implementing large scale neural networks. And here essentially almost just to prove a point, uh, we printed a large array of, I think this is 225 input uh, waveguides mapped onto close to 500 output waveguides. And here the real essential feature is the 200 micrometer scale bar, um, which shows that this really already is imp uh, implementable at a fraction of the size of the 2D implemented circuits we showed before. Of course, these are so far not reconfigurable. Once written, they are permanent. Um, and this is one of the essential steps of what we have to do in the future. And of these first uh, proof of concept demonstrations, um, essentially we uh, characterized the optical performance. It was not half bad for the beginning. So uh, either one to nine and one to 81 splitters both had losses less than 10 dB. And uh, the symmetry of the splitting was not uniform, but uh, rather uh, uh, well, for first demonstration was satisfactory. And we now develop very uh, serious approaches where this becomes completely symmetric, but to this uh, later. From that, we moved on and implemented some functional top topologies. So in neural networks, convolution is really a very powerful concept. If you want to do a 2D information transformation, 
often you need to detect features in these uh, more, more macroscopic features in these informations, edge detection, et cetera. And for this, you use uh, many times convolutional neural networks, where in the end you do convolution of your input information with a certain convolutional kernel. So here we implemented a discrete or Boolean kernel, so they're not uh, the GABO filters, which you can hear uh, uh, always in connection with convolutional neural networks. There are uh, half filters, which are the Boolean version of those. And here in this uh, uh, design, we realized uh, uh, nine convolutional kernels with a width of three, and all of them are implemented fully in parallel. So here, essentially, you see the nine filters. On the top of each of these boxes, you see the output waveguide. And at the bottom, you would see the input waveguide as output waveguide is connected to. And uh, this is the 3D wiring topology. So you can imagine, and in, in yellow, we see a highlight for filter two. So if you want to implement this in 2D, you can immediately see the challenge you're facing. I mean, at least I don't see an immediate mapping from the 3 to 2D. And then we characterize these filters, uh, I want to say, in the backward direction, because forward direct, uh, characterization would be significantly more challenging. Um, and at least uh, as a, a first uh, confirmation, it shows really a nice correlation between the, between the targeted and the obtained uh, uh, connectivity topologies. This uh, very bright blob here is essentially a crosstalk from our injection laser in the backward direction to the camera because these circuits are very small. They are of 40 micrometer height. And we did not include here uh, tapers of the waveguide uh, cores in order to collect essentially all the light injected. So this here is essentially crosstalk from the injection laser. So if you would, would remove this and associated scattering, these plots would be much cleaner. And to show you the, let's say, a uh, a full system vision of this, you would print these then in arrays, and with this, you would have essentially local convolutional transformation of the 2D input, and all of this would uh, happen fully in uh, parallel and completely passive. So, the energy uh, 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 consumed by this transformation would simply be the optical losses and the optical signal you need for the uh, following detection. Good. So the first approach was very nice for, let's say, a uh, rather unworried first uh, proof of concept. Um, however, a downside was that essentially, if you're not very, very careful, then you end up in a situation where the optical field propagating in these waveguides is highly multimode because we have a very big refractive index difference uh, of uh, delta n is around 0 0.5, which allows somewhere between 30 and 60 moles to be propagating in these waveguides, where in the previous examples we used the diameter of 1.2, 1.3 micrometer, and right now we are doing very interesting work with 2 micrometer diameter. So we wanted to extend this platform, and um, if you look at single, uh, simple optical fibers, what you actually see is that between a core and a cladding, you have a rather small refractive index contrast of the order of 10 to the minus 2. So and if you now look at uh, the refractive index development of this uh, polymerization reaction, either one photon or two photon polymerization, you can see that actually depending on the exposure dose <coughs> per voxel, or not per voxel, but basically the energy deposited in each voxel, what you can see that it can induce refractive index changes which are of the similar order as in uh, as found in normal um, uh, fiber integration. So this essentially is what we wanted to leverage. Uh, and if you look at the maths of uh, simple um, mode solutions, uh, LP mode solutions to cylindrical waveguides, what you can essentially find is you want a refractive index contrast of 10 to the minus 2 to have feature sizes of a waveguide of the order 2 to 5, 6 micrometer in diameter in order to be in the monomode regime. So in this regime, you essentially only allow the fundamental mode to propagate in your waveguide, and all higher order modes are, uh, are forbidden solutions, and essentially they uh, um, radi radiate away into the cladding of your, if your wave rates, should they be excited. Okay, so this motivated us to do uh, some work in this direction, and for this we paired up with the group of Demichip Saltis because he was interested in a similar approach 
and we were in quite close contact. Uh, and essentially, we now use this what we call three plus one D laser writing in order to implement three uh, D optical structures for different applications. So the first uh, step was to characterize uh, the structure of this kind of uh, uh, um, exposure controlled refractive index distribution in 3D. And there we uh, relied on the <laughs> excellent expertise of Dimitri. I mean, this is what he's doing since decades, uh, holography. Um, so at KPFL, they have a nice uh, digital holography setup, interferometric setup. Essentially, they use a helium neon laser, they split it, uh, uh, then propagate it in a collimated fashion through the sample, and then they image the near field of the sample onto a camera after interfering with the collimated reference beam. And with this, essentially, you can measure the number of face slips as the, as the light propagates through your sample, and simply by calculating back from the number of interference minima and maxima, essentially, you can recalculate the uh, optical path length difference at every spatial position. <laughs> and essentially, this was calibrated by uh, printing such structures as here, where we uh, um, uh, first printed some kind of rectangular prisms. This is what we used in order to calibrate our system. And then we continued and essentially brought planar structures where the control parameter was the writing power. And then from this, essentially, we could then uh, uh, extract the local refractive index as a function of laser power. And here, uh, you essentially see the fit of the experimental data to linear or the exponential fit, which is the one uh, which you, uh, of course, expect for, expect for such a saturation um, effect. So, and uh, from this, we then continued. And here at FEMTO, what we started with we uh, now started printing 3D blocks of a polymerized material where we exposed, let's say, vertical cylinders with a very high uh, optical power. Um, if I remember correctly, this was uh, 14 uh, milliwatts with, um, the, with the high NA microscope objective. And uh, the surrounding volume only with a very low optical power of, I think, 6 to 7 milliwatts. And uh, we followed here two strategies. Either we implemented essentially a step index kind of structure where the power was constant across the entire volume, which was associated to the waveguide core, or we modified the writing power according to a parabola, which implements essentially a graded index profile. <coughs> and here you see the optical measurements of the output modes, and they really uh, perfectly fit. Um, the um, analytical solutions to cylindrical waveguide uh, propagation. Um, from this, we started to characterize uh, the modal behavior of such systems, and uh, we can really see that it fits perfectly. So here we fitted, when injecting a single mode data, we fitted the confinement factor, which is essentially how much of the energy of the mode is propagating within the core and how much in the cladding. And from this fit, we then uh, see the comparison to what happens when we inject higher order modes. So these were not part of the fit and they agree rather well uh, for the second and the, the third mode. So LP01, LP11, LP02. So the NA there was uh, 0 0.07, it's around half what you get in optical fibers, but it's a very promising starting point. Uh, we extracted the losses, which were around uh, 6 dB per millimeter. For comparison, in silicon photonic state of the art, you get around a bit below 1 dB per centimeter. So let's say this is one and a half, two orders of magnitude higher than the silicon case. And also, we characterized the evanescent coupling between uh, waveguides, where we got down to an uh, interaction rate of uh, 0.02 per millimeter when waveguides were separated by around uh, 6 micrometer, which would allow us to make, to integrate around 10,000 waveguides per millimeter square. So that was our initial efforts um, uh, uh, in this collaboration. Dimitri then went on and the experiments they implemented at the BFL was 3D printing or 3 plus 1D printing of holograms, uh, where, for example, the encoded here uh, letters L and O for the optics laboratory at the APFL, which you can retrieve when you illuminate the sample at different angles. 
or for example, different uh, uh, model multiplexing for the same concept. You uh, send light at a different angle through your hologram and you receive different optical uh, LP modes. So you might think that this is a rather tedious way to record a hologram. Uh, you could just uh, follow the classic classical approach. The problem is if you want to superimpose holograms, then using the classical approach of essentially flood illuminating and recording of each individual holograms scales with a diffraction efficiency of one over M squared, uh, where M is the number of holograms recorded. And this is really fundamental because uh, uh, writing and erasure, they are two processes which are uh, essentially uh, uh, linked to each other. And therefore, if you can access every volume individually, every voxel in your hologram individually, you break this fundamental scaling and you get to uh, efficiency of one over M, making the system again scalable. So this is basically the big breakthrough, so to say, for uh, green holograms recording using this approach. So as the final outlook I want to show you is uh, work we have just now essentially finished and we I hope we submitted this week. So I already said here submitted. I was I thought it will be today, maybe tomorrow, I will be sure. <laughs> um, and what we do here is we combine two and one photon uh, polymerization. So let's say waveguide cores, we write following our classical approach, we do the high NA or we do the focusing inside of our material. Here we switch to IPS uh, uh, um, as a photoresin because the waveguides are of the order of three, four micrometer diameter, and therefore we do not need this ultra high resolution of IP dip. Um, but that's all we do in two photon. Um, and the remaining volume of our circuit, which are the cladding and the inactive volume, let's say, you polymerize using blanket illumination with UV. And as you can see here, both of them allow you to control the degree of polymerization, i.e. the refractive index. Um, and essentially what we do is such a three-step uh, process. Course of waveguides, we write with a very high resolution and the uh, adequately adjusted power in order to get really smooth walls uh, um, and uh, hopefully low losses. Mechanical support structures, we uh, use uh, something which we, we call in the group Rumbo printing because we really go to the maximum. So we use almost maximum exposure uh, optical writing power and very large hatching and slicing distances. And with this, essentially, uh, we do not care about the optical quality. They can be rough surfaces with uh, micro explosions, et cetera, as long as they're mechanically sturdy. And with this, we uh, dramatically reduce the time we need for printing. And then essentially the remaining volume, which uh, is what we uh, polymerize in one go using such a UV chamber. So we essentially repeated our optical characterization. Here again, you see a fit to the fundamental mode. And uh, we uh, investigated the fundamental waveguide parameters versus the exposure dose using UV uh, uh, basically of exposing our circuit for different amounts of time. So these millijoule per centimeter squared, this zero, of course, we do not expose the remaining polymer uh, monomer resin. And then essentially these correspond to different exposure times. So I think this here is uh, um, 60 seconds, uh, five seconds and 20 seconds. I think this could be correct roughly for a commercial chamber. What you can see here is that uh, we achieve now an ACE which are very close to commercial fibers and uh, the expected uh, decay width of the NA with the UV uh, exposure dose. Um, we measured the stability of our circuits because at the beginning we were really worried that uh, since we do not finish the polymerization uh, pro process, that actually uh, the confinement or the, the reflective index contrast between cores and surrounding material will dramatically drop over time. Uh, but to our pleasant surprise, we found that now across three, four months, these circuits are actually essentially completely stable. We do not see a systematic de deterioration over time. And even for the unpolymerized material, this remained constant. Uh, important to know here is that these samples were not put into a black box or black uh, shelf or blackout shelf. They were just left in the lab within these classical plastic uh, boxes 
and therefore they were subject to normal, you know, let's say artificial irradiation as you find in normal, um, you know, in a normal setting. To be aggressive, uh, we printed another sample uh, and across the summer holidays, we put it on uh, the window shelf and uh, not surprisingly, Red Wing came back, there was essentially nothing left. So if you really expose it to broadband uh, illumination like the sun, uh, which has uh, significant fractions in the blue UV, uh, and you have absolutely no protection, then the circuit does det uh, deteriorate. Besides this, there's another uh, temporal aspect, and this is fabrication time. So if you want to derive the uh, fill factor of our photonic circuit, we essentially get this information by this uh, 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 evanescent coupling rate, which I showed you before. And uh, we have, these are rather fundamental numbers because you have the exponential decay of the mode uh, inside of the cladding. And essentially, if you want to get to such a low interaction, you always need, let's say, something of three, four uh, times the diameter of your single mode cutoff frequency. And therefore, this ratio is rather constant where R is the radius of our waveguide and S is basically the spacing between the two. And then simply by, uh, simply by geometry of area of a unit cell between such uh, neighboring waveguides, you can derive the uh, fin factor, which is then proportional to the fabrication time. And essentially the upper limit for this fin factor, if we do not want significant interaction between waveguides, uh, between neighboring waveguides, is around 16. So in other uh, 16 percent. So in other words, um, using our combination of two and one photon fabrication, we should uh, approximate only uh, fabrication times which are 16 percent, as if you would fully write the entire circuit using two photon polymerization. And then what we find with a large variety of different scales of systems we've printed was that always we come up somewhere at 10 percent. So this is basically confirming this in the experiment. So finally, we now uh, entered a different regime for fabrication sizes, simply because of the reduced uh, uh, fabrication time and also uh, the fabricate uh, the propagation losses, uh, which is very, uh, 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 which is very positive. So we printed waveguides uh, ranging from uh, 20 microns, I think, until six millimeters in length. Uh, I know that for robustness, we need to fill in here a few points. But the losses, uh, the scaling of the losses with propagation length uh, is of such high quality that I do not expect any surprise in between here. And what we get now across these uh, uh, two, three orders of magnitude is 13 dB per centimeters, which is now only, uh, let's say, one order of magnitude away from the silicon photonics. So we're moving ever closer. And I really want to say that here we did not spend a very big effort of uh, improving these losses. So I'm pretty confident that just by fine tweaking parameters, and these are um, uh, uh, really our first proof of concept realizations of this two plus one D, uh, uh, one photon fabrication technique, that we can really reduce these significantly for, uh, further. So I think uh, for this resin, the material limit would be somewhere at 5 dB per centimeter. And here you can see a, a nice, let's say, uh, optical artist illustration of the structures we are now able to print. So within this, you, we really draw a single mode waveguide from the top of the structure, which is six millimeter in height, all the way to the bottom of, I think in this case, it was 2.8 micrometers in diameter. And these are the losses, including injection, uh, what we get at the output. And this is just for scale comparison in normal, in normal match. Um, and now I have, uh, let's say, five minutes. So are you, are you interested in a more, let's say, hands-on demonstration of uh, neural networks or we, we stop it at here? I leave that up to the, to the chair of the, the seminar. Yep. Uh, Daniel, please go ahead uh, for a few minutes more. Okay. Good. So um, this is now completely unrelated work to this, but I think it's uh, nonetheless interesting. So. Um, because it shows in the end the systems we want to merge. So previously I showed you the linear part, how will we uh, move towards uh, 3D integration of the linear vector matrix product. And now I'll show you our vision, let's say, for implementing the nonlinear layers, the neuronal layers. So the concept we leverage is something called um, reservoir computing, 
And that's, let's say, a very appealing starting point for uh, neural network computing because a reservoir comprises an input layer. So this would be an image that would be the pixels. This information is injected into a uh, neural uh, network of neurons, which are connected complex uh, with a complex topology. <laughs> but important is that for optimization, i.e. learning, training the system, these two connection topologies are not touched. So, in other words, you can implement them in the experiment, and if they're constant, you're happy with it. So, the only thing what you do in order to optimize the computing result what this is the, that the system provides you with is you optimize these readout connections. So, this would be the output layer. So, let's say for the toy example of classifying cats and dogs, this is an image, and then you have two outputs, uh, which one of them should be high if the input was a cat, and the other one should be low and vice versa for a dog. So what this makes this interesting is that we can implement these fully in hardware and that they allow us to really, from a fundamental point of view, study the properties if we realize that such systems. Because these are not uh, uh, your classical uh, neural network concepts anymore implemented in, in, in a double precision digital systems. And therefore, their behavior changes, and also the learning concepts you leverage, they need to change. So, what we use here to realize our reservoir are a, a semiconductor laser, uh, a vertical cavity surface emitting laser. Uh, you all will have seen them essentially, laser pointers are often pixels. Uh, uh, yeah, they are essentially everywhere. They're one of the most commonly produced uh, 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 semiconductor lasers. The interesting feature is if you increase them, typically below uh, beyond four micrometer in size, then be, they become highly multi-mode. So if they are single mode, then the the rate equation model would essentially be three dimensional only. So carriers, field, amplitude, and phase, um, and that doesn't give you much dimensionality to implement the neurons of such a layer. However, if you increase it, then this becomes a a very very high dimensional system. Because essentially you need to model the spatial positions with a fine grid. Um, and they are complexly interacting by mostly two mechanisms uh, uh, inside of the, the pixel. So a pixel comprises of a top mirror and a bottom mirror. And in the middle between is a quantum well. So inside of this quantum well, carriers can diffuse. So that creates a local interaction. And the field between these mirrors, the photon field, uh, basically spreads across the entire cavity simply by photon diffraction. So these are the two coupling mechanisms and they are essentially implementing this part of the network. And uh, semiconductor lasers are highly nonlinear. There are various nonlinear effects, uh, the thresholding of the lasing, gain saturation, spectral, spatial hole burning, uh, but most of all uh, the Henry alpha factor, which is essentially coupling amplitude and phase. So the neural network we realize essentially is we use a spatial light modulator that is illuminated with an information input laser that we image onto multimode fiber. And this multimode fiber now implements a linear and a complex, usually random connection matrix, which is constant. <clears throat> so this essentially is what we use to implement these weights. So the Vixel um, internal physics implement these connections. And the multi-mode fiber implements the input connection between input information and our neural network. And then essentially we image the near field of our laser onto a detector, but between this imaging path, we place another spatial light modulator. And this spatial light modulator now allows us to modify the superposition of spatial uh, near fields on this detector via the local modulation of the spatial light modulator. And with this, essentially, we program our photonic neural network. <clears throat> so how do we optimize this is, uh, you can imagine, we inject some input information into the system. The input information is encoded on the spatial input spatial light modulator. The large area laser uh, makes a high dimensional spatial nonlinear transformation of this. And then we load, for example, a random configuration on our readout spatial light modulator. Um, the detector um, records this such modulated field intensity, and then we compare this to the result we want. So, for example, was it a cat, yes or no? Uh, we do this for a bunch of examples, and then we change the configuration of the readout spatial light modulator at the position of a few pixels. 
we again inject this information and again record the error. If the error now got reduced, then we keep this modification. If the error increased, then we go back to the previous stage and change some other pixels. And with this, essentially, we iteratively go down in a kind of gradient descent algorithm in order to minimize our computing error. And here, uh, what you can see in this uh, video, essentially, so I recorded this, I'm almost proud of it. I recorded this with, a, with my cell phone because this way I couldn't speed up anything. And what you see now is how we program this neural network to do two-bit classification. So that's, of course, not very challenging, but it's, a, you know, it's an illustrative task where we encode two bit patterns on the input SLM and our output detector, for example, needs to identify a certain digit. So digit number three, for example, or it needs to do the XOR of the input or a digital analog conversion. So what you see here now is a uh, little window popping up on the X axis. You see the number of example configurations on the output SLM specialized modulator, and on the y-axis you see the comp computing error. And after we explore the configuration landscape, we find a direction where the system can efficiently be uh, 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 optimized. The algorithm then iteratively goes down into the, uh, on this cost function error landscape, and after around 20 seconds, essentially the system has learned and uh, it doesn't do any, any mistake anymore. So what's really fascinating here is that the computer, the classic computer, does not interfere with the computing anymore. At no stage, anything is sent backwards and forwards once the information has been encoded at the input. So the entire injection, the entire transformation, and the optimized matrix product are implemented in fully parallel and therefore scalable photonic hardware. And what you've seen here for me is a very fascinating uh, success because previously it took us one day to make such a curve. Now it takes us uh, 20 seconds. And uh, this is limited by the communication between the scope and the computer. So if we really push this to the time scales of the laser, then instead of learning in 20 seconds, this would learn in 10 microseconds. And this basically is the, let's call it a long-term vision. And since the energy efficiency per operation is essentially <clears throat> the, the power times the time you need for this computing, all of this feeds into the energy efficiency. And now, essentially, to conclude, I just uh, show a few other examples where we programmed the same system, not for two bit, but for six bit header recognition. Uh, we did the same for XORs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we recorded its sensitivity to, let's say, drift of wavelength. Uh, and the really most surprising and positive uh, outcome of this is actually its accuracy or the consistency. So in computing, essentially, you want every time you repeat a computation that you get the same result if nothing has changed. Otherwise, it's, uh, it's pretty much useless. And what we do here is we created a stream of uh, 1,000 random input images. Uh, we loaded the connection matrix with a constant random matrix. And then we repeated that stream of information 50 times and measured the cross correlation between the individual responses. And what we found is that this is higher than 99.5, mostly in average around 99.7% correlation. It means that even though the entire concept is analog, you can still uh, uh, achieve uh, reproducibility of our computational results above 99.7%. Okay, and with this, in the end, uh, I've come to my conclu conclusion. So the 3D integration, for me, uh, it is fundamentally required in order to realize next generation scalable uh, neural network integration and photonics there has a fundamental advantage. Uh, we are fastly moving to really promising, uh, let's say, uh, benchmark values. And then, of course, what has to be done in the next step this uh, stage is uh, realizing the programmability of these circuits. And in the last section, I showed you autonomous photonic neural networks, uh, but here I don't want to go too much into the details. If you have questions, of course, you can ask me. And uh, I'd like to thank you for attention. Thank you, Daniel, for the nice talk. So now we have uh, time for uh, questions. So just raise your hand or just feel free to ask directly the questions. 